The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. This bizarre twist on the Zelda formula pits Link against perhaps the greatest enemy of all, time itself. With its dark themes and fantastic gameplay that features mechanics unlike anything else in the series or even gamedom itself, Majora has set itself in stone as a certified hood classic. And now that it's finally been released on Switch with not only shockingly great quality, but also repairs to almost every issue the rest of the games I've had on the service, I'm fresh out of things to see them mauled over. So how do we remedy this? This is the V3 steering wheel made by Interact for the Nintendo 64. I received this as a birthday gift one year and it has remained a welcome addition to my collection. I keep it right there, right next to my virginity. And honestly, as its own thing, it's pretty cool, even if it is quite cumbersome. But in case you lack critical thinking skills and can't read, I'll be attempting to beat the entirety of Majora's Mask using only this wheel. Before we commence the kicking and screaming, let's talk about the finer rules. Obviously, I have to complete this game from start to finish using only this wheel as an input method. Any and all glitches are fair game, although as you'll soon see that isn't going to help much. Also, for some reason, I decided to play the NSO version for this run, which means I also can't use the built-in save states, obviously. And any of you who have tried an N64 controller adapter for the Switch will know that in most cases the controls get completely butchered. So I'll just be rolling with any missing actions the best I can, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. With the rules set and my horse stolen, we dive headlong into the first bit of gameplay on the hunt for the Skull Kid. And it is here that I get my first taste of the might of the wheel. So how does it fare? Well, the Z button doesn't work. Okay, all right. All right, we're living with it. We're, we're gonna, you know what, we take those L's. Oh my God, this is awful. I could do this, I could still do this. I could turn myself and then I can press up to like recenter the, oh my God. This means that Z-targeting is out, which means I'm going to need to rely on manual aiming for the entire run. Also, bomb hovers, gainers, index warp, and pretty much all glitches within my skill set are out as well. So, you know, nervousness rising. I also realized that if there was ever a point in the game where I needed to Z-target, I'd be screwed. So I decided to treat it as an additional condition to work under. And if there was ever a point where I needed to Z-target, I'll swap controllers for that single input and swap right back. It's not cheating, it's a bonus challenge. Other than that though, the controls came out surprisingly clean. Don't get me wrong, controlling this game with a steering wheel is as bad as it sounds, and torturous enough for a whole video. But everything else pretty much works as intended. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Turning the wheel moves you across the x-axis, and this really stiff thing on the side moves you across the y-axis. B works, A is mapped to both a button on the wheel as well as both pedals, and I use the latter for the added challenge. All four C buttons work as intended, which is incredible to me. And the same with R, although it took me a while to figure that out. <gasps> oh my god, I can shield! Wait, what? I can shield- I could have been shielding this whole time, bro! Overall, I'd say we got off pretty well with just losing Z. Don't get me wrong, Z is absolutely the worst button we could have lost, but the fact that it's the only one? I was honestly expecting worse. So after being successfully trolled and gaining my side bitch, I enter Clock Town for the first cycle. Since I can't gain her, I have to do this legit, which means helping the local thuggery, gaming on the Skulltulla, Moon's Tear, you know, the works. This first cycle doesn't have any intense issues, but catching the bomber kids is a good showcase of how hard it can be to aim and how the controls just won't register inputs every once in a while, which makes doing actions quickly a bitch. With the Ocarina of Time shoved safely in my tunic, we can officially say that Cycle 1 has gone on without any issues. Except I forgot to record the wheel cam, so... Whoops. But hey, I'm human again! And now I can finally leave town and make my way to the southern swamp. So you're probably asking yourself right now how I plan on doing this in the first place. Well, first of all, don't ever use that fucking tone with me again, young lady. And secondly, as far as traversal and puzzles go, it's really just going to be a matter of mastering this piece of fucking plastic. And fighting is mostly going to be a matter of brute force. There's no way I'm doing 100%, but getting as many heart containers and bottles as I can is going to help out a ton since being able to outlast opponents is a reliable strategy that can be employed on any enemy. That's not to say I won't be brain blasting any fights, god knows it's required in some of the more open end encounters. But this is me trying to beat Majora's Mask with a steering wheel, so if there's an easy out, I'm taking it. On my way to the Deku Palace, I picked up a few heart pieces, got my first bottle, and gamed on the local wildlife. Deku Palace is the first major roadblock. The stealth sections proved to be pretty annoying because the camera gets locked in a fixed position. This isn't normally an issue, but since the wheel separates movements from the X and Y axis into two different inputs, it can get really disorienting and makes getting the heart container and bean a struggle. Especially when you forget to get the spring water and have to do the whole thing a third time. But that's nothing compared to the path up to the Sonata of Awakening. 
I've had to fly a few times as Deku, but the segments have never been worth mentioning because they're all very short. But the path up to the monkey's cage, unnotoriety constitutes does not. If you don't know what this is all about, you have to fly above the palace courtyard between these moving platforms and take out enemies until you get to the other side of the castle and enter the monkey's cage from the back. Some things to note about flying is that it acts kind of like tank controls where you can only move forward and backward, except unlike tank controls, you can't fully turn in another direction, only steer slightly while moving forward. So if you get turned around or God forbid the camera gets cucked, there is absolutely nothing you can do. Remember, the only reliable way to move the camera is to send it to your back with Z, but since I can't use Z, I can't change the camera. This is also a pain in the ass in other parts of the game, but at least on foot, you can recenter it by going into first person, but not in the air. Combine these controls with having to precisely land on moving platforms, dealing with enemies who can knock you down while you're flying, and the sheer length of the section and you will cry. I FUCKING DID IT DUDE! LET'S GET IT! YES! YES! <gasps> it took me about an hour and change, but hey, I did it. And with that, we have our ticket into the first temple. With a fresh cycle on the horizon and my confidence thoroughly down the shitter, I shoved a fairy in a mason jar, packed some trail mix, and made my way to Woodfall. Apparently, Woodfall was so traumatizing that I didn't write anything about it in my notes, so I guess we're just going to do this part of the story from memory. Since the spin attack can't be consistently pulled off with God's gift to gaming here, I know I was just as surprised as you. The stray fairies in here are next to useless, only serving to refill my pitiful life bar when it's convenient. The Deku flying in here is kept pretty simple. In fact, so are most things, which is to be expected since it's the first temple in the game. Uh, that said, I wasn't completely safe. This room in particular has you running across small platforms delivering a flame to torches and a tight time limit. Do you, uh, do you see the problem? It's moments like these that really make me appreciate the ace precision a steering wheel affords. I almost died in the next room too, but luckily my panicking flails were fat enough to get me through without a scratch. Got the bow, fixed the water, and it was off to get the boss key. Gecko and Snapper guard this one in particular, and let me tell you, these guys really drove me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what you're supposed to do is knock him off the turtle with these Deku pads, and then while he's crawling on the ceiling, Z-target onto him and hit him with an arrow. So no Z-targeting means I have to shoot this chap down manually. With this! Have I stressed how much of a pain in the ass this is yet? Penetrated, stolen, fuck, and release. Except no, because now we have to fight Odawa. The great thing about this battle is that there isn't any one clear path to take, and he can be handled in a multitude of ways. I found the best strategy was to stun him with Deku Nuts and then give him the old dick twisting routine. It was pretty close, but he goes down, and we go right up and out, taking the first boss remains, the oath to order, a full heart container, and the Deku Princess with us. I saved the monkey from being falsely executed, that was a thing I forgot to mention. Got told to meet the Deku Butler outside the palace, and after ignoring that edict, I spent the rest of the cycle collecting heart pieces, getting some useful masks, and carving my way through the next area. In Snowhead, I got the Lens of Truth, Goron Mask, and the Goron Lullaby, which is needed to access the area's temple. This is also when I got to try out rolling for the first time. The beauty of this is that at max acceleration, it controls basically like a car, with your forward momentum being automatic as long as you hold down the pedal and steering just like a car. You'd think this, the exact situation this wheel was designed for would be where it really shines, but nope. And I can't even say exactly why. The steering is just too sensitive, and if you turn too hard, all your momentum is thrown in that direction, fully committing you and likely heading you right for a wall. All this combined with the fact that this game expects a certain level of delicacy and precision with these glorious creatures, and you've got a control scheme that is at best as good as sticks and buttons, and at worst, well, you'll see that later. Now empowered with Goron Girth, I got a few more heart containers, bombed into the coast for the Zora Mask and a few more collectibles, depositing my cash and reverting to the moment of my birth. Woo! Okay, so we've accomplished quite a lot, and barring a few moments of anguish, things have ranged from kind of hard to optional. But if you can believe me, which of course you can, it gets even worse. Let me introduce you to Snowhead. One number eight. Alright, party time. These will not be necessary. New day, new problems, but before we get to those, I start preparations for tackling the second dungeon, which includes grabbing money, supplies, and finally getting the Great Fairy Mask, as I intend to get all the stray fairies for double magic, which is one of the few ammunition upgrades I'll actually be getting in this run. Without dick aiming, go on rolling, and Zora swimming are, having extra magic is going to make all of these less painful. Eh, sorry, not less painful, more like a bigger margin for error. With my sword deposited at the smiths for upgrading and my ass thoroughly frozen off, it is finally time to fuck Snowhead in its snowhead. The good thing about this temple is that it's very vertical and requires moving across small platforms to ascend, with any mistakes sending you all the way down to the bottom. I really should learn what this word means. 
I fell a lot in here, not just by accident. There are points where the dungeon will force you to descend, especially if you're going for all the fairies. But hey, I got the fire arrows, and Wizrobe was pretty manageable in both of his fights. So honestly, it could have been worse. I know that because fighting Goat was worse. The thing about this fight is that, yeah, it's much harder, but since it's an incredibly linear ordeal, I didn't need to, and really couldn't, shake up my strategy at all. And I fought him how most people normally do. The problem with that is that the normal way is incredibly grueling. Goat's cool, yeah, but his fight can take a mighty long time, and of course, even longer when you're using the retarded cousin of controllers over here. <coughs> and remember, this entire time I'm holding down the pedal to accelerate, and you know what that means. Oh my god, oh my god, it hurts so badly. Uh, no! Oh my god, it's so frustrating. Go! Go! Oh, you know you're gaming when you have to pause and take breaks to massage the cramps out of your feet. Yeah, I don't really know what else to say about goat besides ouch and asshole. Oh my god, finally! Ow! My hand! <laughs> that was the opposite of what I was expecting from that fight. Oh. Uh. Oh. Oh my god. Oh my god! My hand! It's like straight up sore from fighting goat! Uh, oh. That was funny. But you know what I got plenty to say about is the Goron race, which is probably the single most frustrating part of this playthrough. Just getting there was a pain in the ass. You have to get this powder keg to a boulder blocking the track while the fuse is still going. This is both for the race itself and to get the powder keg license, and let me tell you, I never realized how short this fuse was until I started my anti-inclines movement. I don't give a shit if they help disabled people, anything that defies me needs to die. It took me a few tries, but that's nothing compared to what lies beyond that rock. Before even entering, I went back and traded my fairies for double magic, as I expected this to be hard, but dude, what fuck the even. In case you're unfamiliar with the Goron race, it's a mini game that rewards you with an empty bottle and gold dust the latter being needed to permanently upgrade your sword. You race down a track, making sure to keep your speed up while hitting magic pots, all the while you're getting fucking railed from every direction, knocking you off course and making you lose your momentum. This can be pretty frustrating on its own, especially when you consider the AI of the Goron's rubber bands, but this wheel will fight you just as hard as the rest of the course, if not harder. I know I talked about how dick Goron rolling is, but it was never so apparent as when you're trying to outrun this pack of cheating cunts. There are two modes this wheel has. Go! Get spikes, you fucking retard! And why is it always, always an issue at the one fucking part? I smashed into these walls so many times, I actually started messing around with the wheel's sensitivity options to make the controls less touchy. Which did help, but it still took a tremendous amount of patience, skill, luck, my ability to scream, which I was quickly running out of, and time. Oh yeah, time! Do you remember how I said I dropped my sword off at the smith? Well, it takes until the dawn of the following day to get upgraded once, and if I wanted to fully upgrade the sword with the gold dust, I'd need to beat this before the dawn of the final day, at which point I would need to refight Goat and redo the Goron race. Ho! 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 Yes! Eat a dick! Yes! Oh! Oh my god! We're going right there! Oh! Oh! I guess this is the timeline where you live. Got the bottle, got the gilded sword, got my voice back about a day later, and got to tell Snowhead to go fuck itself. Okay, so in a casual run, the next thing you would do is the ranch, allowing you to get a bonus song, which allows you to get the Garo's mask, as well as opening up aliens, which gives you an additional bottle. After doing that, you could do the bandit side quest for the Romani's mask, which gives you access to a secret club that has another bottle and a reliable supply of Chateau, a drink that gives you infinite magic for a cycle. The ranch is fucking loaded. How did I fare? Well, I got the Garo's mask. What? No, I missed one. Son of a bitch, dude. God damn it. Really? Which one did I- it was probably in the front. Ugh. So aggravating. God damn it. So, if I want to do that, which I don't, I have to- Whoa, what? Whoa, I didn't know that. She gets taken too? 
Oh no! No! Romani's gonna get probed. Uh... <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I didn't know that's what happened. <laughs> what is that out there? What is that? Is that her? Romani? <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's living. She's living. <laughs> I'm not a murderer or a manslaughter or whatever they call it. Hello? Is she not speakable? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I think... This might be a face a fate worse than death. <laughs> so I went to the beaver race for another bottle and a heart piece, but, uh... You need to Z-target the beaver to start the race. Okay, so I started the egg collection to get the new wave bossa nova, the song required to get into the third temple. Got the egg stashed in the pirate's fortress and snapped a picture of one of the pirates for the fishermen so I could get the seahorse and it. Mm. Okay, so without the seahorse, I had to learn the path to Pinnacle Rock and retrieve the eggs there. For real, this segment was more annoying than anything given that with only two bottles, it took multiple trips from both locations, but fuck you, got the new wave, thought about Romani getting probed, and proved to Lulu that her babies were safe from those murdering rapist pirates, I mean strong independent women. On to Great Bay! Okay, this is the temple I was dreading the most up until this point. To be fair, this little fucking thing right here makes dolphin jumping as Zora much easier and is one of the only things in the entire game I can say is just as good and maybe even a little better than an actual controller. The mask is used heavily in here, but beyond that, all three bosses, that would be Wart, Round 2 with Gecko, and Gyorg have me shitting the bricks. Metaphorically, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'll talk more about Gyorg in a second, but Gecko Round 2 has you chase him through these blobs to land hits on him and forces you to freeze him while he's on the ceiling under a strict time limit to weaken him and have him, uh, well, well, not do this. 100% count, I hit him mid-air. He was mid-air, it's okay, I have to play more. Of course he does a shitload of damage and it takes forever. To... And Wart can eat a fucking dick. Even in a normal run, this fight is equal parts flailing around trying to destroy as many of these bubbles as you can and trying to attack fast moving weak spots while being harassed by the remaining bubbles. And the thought of doing all of this with a controller as big as your mom's dick is making me quiver. With a fairy in my tunics lining and my asshole thoroughly clenched, I took a deep breath and rode the turtle to Great Bay. And you know what? It wasn't that bad. Seriously, the bosses kinda got knocked around by me. Gecko wasn't that bad. And good RNG helped me stomp Wart with just a little bit of kicking and screaming. Oh my god. Wait, did I just kill him? The rest of the dungeon, while it had Great Bay's usual jank, was really optimized. Gyorg was tougher than normal, but I managed to perfect my jumps onto the central platform, and he went down without much of a fight. By the time I was watching the Giants cutscene, I realized this might actually be the fastest I've ever beaten the greatest of bays. With double defense banked and the session thoroughly jammed, I was sitting pretty with two entire days left in the cycle. So what now? Well, since it's only night of the first day, I figured I could tackle Iconic Canyon, which starts with the graveyard. Captain Kita was a pretty tricky fight, and with this wheel it took a lot of optimization to finally catch and lay him out. The Captain's Mask lets you open a different grave on each night of the loop. The first giving you the Song of Storms, which is required, the second giving you a heart piece, which I also got, and the final giving you an empty bottle. But that would require doing Dompe's minigame without Z-targeting, and I'd rather die. But of course, it being the first night, I dropped in, dropped them, bombed him, and freed Flat Spirit, while crushing my own. This big slab of cock has the Song of Storms etched on it. How do you read it? Z-targeting, of course. I sat here for a while doing research, trying various things, but to no avail. And the Song of Storms is 100% required, make no mistake, because without bomb hovering and gainers, there's no way I can do the Gibdo well backwards, so we absolutely need it. With a heavy heart and out of focus chakra, I swapped to the pro controller, pressed LT, and swapped back to the wheel, officially killing our bonus challenge. But hey, I got the Song of Storms, and also Chuck's here. I didn't know that. Well, they're stickers, they're not stamps, I guess. You're a sticker. I'm a sticker star. With two hours left until IRL midnight and our energy rapidly running out, we began to carve our way through Icana. Nothing was really different about getting the Gibdo mask, and while you might think that with only two bottles, the well would be a pain in the clitoris, it was surprisingly more like a swig of moxie. Uncomfortable, but quick. With a few exceptions, all the items you need are down here in the well with you, so it's just a matter of trial and error. 
I even found the one and only normal fairy fountain in this game, which is pretty cool. That's what I love about this game. I've beaten it like a hundred times and I'm still learning little things about it like this. Okay, fun's over. Back to the real game. Ah, uh, I got the mirror shield. And I must say, again, using this to reflect light is very intuitive and I can safely say it's better than using a stick. Wonderful. Iconic Castle, despite being one of the coolest mini dungeons in my opinion, was pretty forgettable this time. There was some tricky platforming in here, but I don't know. I guess I didn't have any trouble with it. And all the combat was either easy or could be skipped with the Gibdo mask. But Egos, yeah, he was a pain in the z The point of this fight is that you have to burn these curtains and use the light they produce to cremate the incapacitated bodies of the boss. The King's two ninnies aren't a huge deal, but the big guy himself proved tougher to break. In addition to just being harder, fuck. He has this one move in particular that makes him invincible for a prolonged period of time. So trying to knock him down in an ideal spot for burning his corpse proved to be a test of patience. Well, it's a good thing I crammed the night before. Do you like, do you like CDs? Uh, not especially. You're more of a cartridge kind of guy. Oh, you're talking about video games. Or, or do you prefer cartridges or CDs? I thought you were talking about, like, uh, music. No, um, I, I take either or. I think for, like, collecting and, like, displaying, I think cartridges are cooler, but CDs are obviously far superior for actual practicality. CDs match. In case you couldn't tell, we were both egregiously tired, so we called it for the night. And I woke up the next day intending to make this cycle my last. The climb to Stone Tower and Stone Tower proper were exactly the same. The penultimate challenge of Termina has always been the hardest of the game's dungeons, and while obviously in this run it was harder, shocking, I know, I don't really have anything interesting to say about it. Although I guess some of the stray fairies were a little difficult. Oh, and Gomas was pretty dickish too. Yeah, despite how cool this guy is, his fight is usually a throwaway because of its lack of substance. But let me tell you, with how many shots I was missing and how quickly he was draining my supplies, he was a lot tougher than I remember. But, like with all aspects of life, I crushed him. Fighting Twin Mold with the Giant's Mask is inherently mindless, so nothing really changed here. And guys, I got news for you. We're in the home stretch. With the monstrous Great Fairy Sword in my possession, it was time to end this. I suited up with all the requisite supplies and waited for my scheduled Armageddon. After calling security, saving the tides, and maybe a few other things, and entering the moon, all that was left to do was talk to the purple t and begin the fight for our life. Without the fierce deity mask, this fight becomes a proper final boss. With the first phase posing as the most durable enemy I've fought, his entire front side, which is almost always facing you, is completely immune to damage, and hitting him from the rear so you can make him vulnerable to attack is a pretty complicated process. Also, about halfway through phase one, the boss remains will start hurling projectiles at you, and while you can kill them, I think, it's really a better idea to simply eat their hits and focus on Majora. Phase two, Majora's Incarnation, doesn't deal a ton of damage, but is the fastest opponent you will face. And getting him while he's dancing around just became a job for the patient's pants. Majora's Wrath, fittingly enough, was the toughest enemy I had faced so far. He'll jump back and forth between sides of the arena, usually very far away from you, and just juggle you. His attacks not only have a massive area of effect, but he'll also spawn these top things that'll get in the way just as much as the boss remains. I don't even remember what my strategy was, probably because I didn't have one. But, with the power of Chuck singing, I won. YES! IT'S BEEN DONE! YES! What? I was like, if you think he's gonna beat this, you should lower your standard. I heard you. Just kidding, he is the standard. <laughs> I don't even know what that means! It's been beaten! World Star! Woo! Let's go, baby! World Star! <laughs> World Star. <laughs> to close my thoughts on this, I had a ton of fun. Navigating the world was a bit, sure, but when it came to combat, the lack of Z-targeting and the bulky control scheme forced me to really get creative with a handful of fights, which added a layer of challenge to this otherwise very easy game. In terms of combat, I mean. But I think it's safe to say I wasn't really pushed with this on its own. And if I had played again on an actual N64 with access to Z-targeting, I believe 100% with a steering wheel is absolutely possible. Maybe another time. But for now, I'll say I hope you enjoyed the ride, and I hope to see you around for some more laughs in the future. There was a lot of funny stuff from my recording session, so if you'd be interested in seeing a highlight reel, let me know in the comments. See ya! One thing about this game is you can tell when something's a model and something's a texture because 
all of the models have like black outlines on everything, but the textures are all flat colored. We've been talking about Hello Kitty racing for 15 minutes, Braden.